The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Lee Manley, I'm Senior Director of District Partnerships with Learning Sciences, and I'm your host and co-presenter for today's webinar. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Mary Lynn Jensen, LSI's Director of District Partnerships in Florida, as well as Dr. Beverly Carball, who, along with Dr. Marzano, author the new Marzano-focused teacher evaluation model, which we will learn more about today. So our webinar today is scheduled for just shy of one hour. We will spend the majority of the time introducing you to the new Marzano-focused teacher evaluation model. Then we will open it up for questions. So if you have, you might be familiar with, with the uh, the model, and that's that's great. We're glad to have you, but you also might see some new things uh, that uh, you didn't see before, or you might see some new features and functions within eye observation that might be helpful for your school or, or district. So we are going to start with some information on the model. We will finish with a demonstration of, uh, of eye observation. Uh, the platform that's used to operationalize the model that's used for classroom walkthroughs and teacher and leader evaluation. But before we start, I just have a few helpful reminders for our webinar. First, your audio lines are muted during the presentations. However, we would love to have your questions and comments, so you may do so by using the GoToWebinar question panel located on your screen. Feel free to put those questions in there and we will answer as many as we can. Finally, today's webinar will be recorded uh, with a link that will be distributed to you via email. Feel free to share the presentation with colleagues who are unable to attend. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Beverly Carbaugh who will introduce us to the Marzano Focus Teacher Evaluation Model. Hello, welcome everybody. It's pretty exciting time to see all the folks that are signed up for this webinar. We have several hundred of you and uh, it's also really cool to see that we have people from Florida to the Northeast. We have some State Department of Education. We have uh, school leaders, district leaders. So we have a very uh, diverse audience today. And it's exciting because it says that you're wanting to learn more about teacher evaluation. Sometimes I say teacher evaluation, it's not going to go away. So we really need to keep refining teacher evaluation so that we get a system that uh, really benefits all of us. And that's what Dr. Marzano and I have been working on for the last couple of years is an update to the original model so that uh, it's more focused and uh, has a lot of benefits and we'll talk about that. So Lee, if you wanna page on down for me. So let's start, I wanna ask you a question. So if, uh, and I spent a lot of time, school district, uh, uh, administrator, observing teachers, was a teacher. So, but we're in a different day and time and a lot of times we have to struggle with this question. Do we in our districts have a bridge from the traditional instruction that we're all very familiar with to this new environment in which we live that's standards-based. And there's another caveat with student evidence because it's one thing for us just to have good teaching and be able to implement good instructional techniques, but are we getting results as proven with student evidence? And that's pretty critical. So this is an exciting time. I think it's an exciting time to kind of revisit teacher evaluation. We certainly uh, were at the forefront of teacher evaluation when Race to the Top was rolled out. But now, uh, five, six years later, it, it was time to do uh, a major update and a major focus. So as we work across the country, basically everybody has standards but do you have an evaluation system that is helping your teachers bridge that gap? So the next slide talks about, is there, a, is there a gap in teaching that is resulting perhaps in a rigor gap? And we know that rigor is that hot word out there. It has a lot of definitions, 
but really the teacher is the person that's going to get us to rigor. The standards are there, they're pretty rigorous, and the testing support those standards are pretty rigorous, but it's the teaching that has to help us close that gap. So as we redesigned and looked at this evaluation model, one of the questions that we were working on and trying to uh, answer was what should the focus of evaluation be? Should it be standards? Should it be instruction? Should it be students? Should it be uh, achievement or learning? And in reality, the answer is it has to be all of those. <clears throat> that to have an effective evaluation model, you have to include each of those pieces. Now, it's going to have to be very focused, but we do believe that one size uh, evaluation or one evaluation model can answer all, all of these questions and touch on all of these subjects. So let's talk about more about this model and talk about it as an evidence-based model on the next slide. Because a lot of times as we're out in the field and we're working with teachers and we ask teachers, so tell me why you don't like evaluation. What, what is it about evaluation that uh, gives you the most heartburn or ask you, it gives you the most questions? And they always say, we think evaluation is subjective. Well, part of this design is to make an evaluation model that is very evidence-based. The evidence should be very transparent and clear to observers and teachers. And you'll hear me throughout my little short presentation talk about transparency because for us to be effective as observers or as teachers, we need a totally transparent model. And using evidence is part of that transparency. But some of the benefits of moving to this model and it, whether you have, are working with another model currently or if you're currently using what we call the legacy model, the one of the original Marzano evaluation models, is that the number of elements has been reduced substantially, and we'll see that in a few minutes when we unveil the map itself. But one of the big benefits to this model is there's not scripting involved. And when you get to the protocol, you'll be able to see why there's no scripting involved. And <coughs> I apologize, I have a tickle in my throat here. But another benefit that uh, is, is built into this model is that it reduces time that you have to spend on actual evaluation. It, it allows you to go in, make meaningful observations that will in at the end of the year roll into your evaluation. Because when we originally rolled out the original model, it was uh, thought that observers would be in doing formal kinds of observations four or five, six times a year. And in reality, that doesn't happen. And we have all the data uh, in our uh, eye observation platform to actually uh, substantiate that. So part of the task in redesigning this model was to look at how we could help those uh, evaluators and even teachers in the evaluation process. So like I said, there's a focus on standard student evidence and using that evidence to get formative feedback. So let's talk a minute about the next slide, which says, what is the real goal of evaluation? Why do we invest a lot of time? Why do we invest a lot of money in districts? This is the critical question. And this is where I call it the philosophical question that we really have to agree on. Do we want evaluation just to be a measurement system? System, which aligns highly with compliance, we got to do it or checking off the boxes, or do we want to have an evaluation system that will help us produce better teachers or expert teachers that's focused on growth? And in reality, you need a balance of that because at the end of the day, we have to do the compliance parts of it. But we really need a system that is safe for teachers to experiment, try new instructional strategies, try to uh, build the rigor in and learn how to use instructional rigorous uh, instructional strategies. So that's the growth part of it. And as we look at and explore this model, I think you're going to see that we can accomplish both of them even in a more simplistic focus model. And the next slide that I want us to look at to me is something that's really exciting for us as educators. We talk about the fact that we use data to drive our decisions. So when Dr. Marzano and I were looking and 
talking about the update to this model, I said, Bob, look at all this data that we have out of eye observation. And it says that about half of the time that we spend teaching, we are talking about the critical information, we're practicing, we're reviewing, we're chunking, and all of those are good foundational skills. They don't need to go away because that's where you start. However, they aren't that those instructional strategies that are going to help us bridge that gap to get to rigor. These are foundational, and if you're using a taxonomy, sometimes these are down there on the lower levels of the taxonomy. And then look at, uh, if you're able to see the slide, uh, it says that these strategies are most closely associated with what I'm going to say teacher-driven instruction, which could be lecture, which could be a lot of practice, a lot of reviewing, where the teacher's doing all the heavy work. And what we really need is, there's a line here that's kind of drawn uh, right in the middle of this slide. What we need to see is the shift from these foundational kinds of strategies to look at these strategies down at the bottom. These are strategies that promote cognitively complex thinking skills on, for students. So over on the left, you see the instructional strategies used by teachers that will cause their students to think harder, to critically think is what we called it back in the good old days. But so they're more cognitively complex. They are, and we could add similarities and differences on there, it, it, engaging uh, students in tasks to uh, revise their knowledge. Uh, tasks that have them to generate and test hypothesis or probability. So all of these tasks are where we want to move our students. And we actually have updated this, uh, this particular piece of data. And we've looked at it for many years. And look at the percentage of time. It's actually gotten a little better, but it's still under 4% of our time is actually used, is actually spent in the classroom on the most critical kinds of teaching strategies and student activities that will lead us to rigor. And what you're going to see in the new model is that we've really spelled out some of these instructional strategies that we will actually evaluate whether you're using them in your classroom. So, but why I find this exciting is that we say we use current data, and in this update to the model, we actually use current data to help drive the updates to the model. So, all of the original research stays in place, doesn't go away, it's just been realigned, uh, in some cases streamlined, but with the call for standards and the rigor of standards, we know we have to move from the top of this map to the bottom. I sometimes jokingly say we almost need to uh, invert this, and what we have at the bottom needs to be about 50% of the time, and what we have at the top, the other 50% of the time. So let's talk about the actual work of teaching. In the next slide, we actually, if we reduce the role of a teacher down into their biggest areas of responsibility, I think we could probably all agree that uh, there's four big, if you look at the orange uh, blocks there, we would say that it all starts in planning, that for a teacher to be effective, for a teacher to have those instructional strategies that are going to move uh, students to thinking more uh, complexly, it all begins in the planning stage. But then after you plan it, you have to teach it. So planning to use the correct instructional strategies and the activities aligned to those strategies. It's not just the use of the strategy. You have to have the appropriate activities. So you've got to plan it. You have to teach it. But kind of uh, hard to separate from the uh, instruction is do you have the right conditions for learning in your classroom? Sometimes we, when I'm out in the field uh, working with groups, we talk about, so which comes first, the conditions or standards-based instruction? And some people will say, well, yeah, 
can't teach them if you don't have the right conditions in the classroom. So those two areas of responsibility, or we call them domains, those two large domains really are inseparable because you can uh, probably use the most rigorous instructional strategies, but if you don't have any kind of relationship or you have chaos in your classroom and you don't have an environment uh, where, which facilitates learning, you're probably not gonna get any student evidence that shows your kids are learning. So you plan it, you teach it, you have the right conditions, but kind of the domain that's the foundation and support for everything is the domain of professional responsibilities. Because if we don't have those professional responsibilities, we're probably not going to do our planning. We're probably not going to be a part of a PLC. We're probably not going to continue to grow. So we've kind of taken the life of a teacher, what we do in the classroom, and this is what I'm going to say. We've broken it down to the very basic uh, uh, four big structures or domains. So planning it, teaching it, creating an environment, but then the foundation for all of it is our professional responsibilities as a teacher. So not only do we have the domains, let's look at what we have done with what I'm gonna call the success map or a map or a guideline for our evaluation system. So Lee, will you go ahead and just put the whole map up there and then I'll walk through it. Yeah, thank you. So we talked about those four domains that uh, we believe captures the big areas of responsibility of a teacher. But look at uh, each of those domains underneath them, what you see are those bullet points. Those are actually elements or key indicators or performance standards. So these are the supporting pieces, the major supporting pieces to uh, to each of those domains. Now, and if, if any of you are familiar with Dr. Marzano's book, The Art and Science of Teaching, and you read that book, you probably read uh, and found in there uh, 40 some different instructional strategies. But in this model, you're going to see that those instructional strategies have been reduced tremendously. If you are a uh, current user of a Marzano evaluation system, either the legacy or the 2014, which still had 60 elements in that in those evaluation systems, what you're going to see is really none of them have gone away. They've just been realigned and many of them are embedded within the, the protocols or the evidences of the model. But uh, as Bob and I often talk, evaluation should not be designed to evaluate every move that a teacher makes. You want to capture the biggest, the most important elements, and then you can work on all of those supporting pieces, all the different moves as part of the growth. Uh, so when you look at this map, it is very focused and it really focuses on those big important, what I'm gonna say individual elements or standards that a teacher needs to accomplish. So if you look at the planning domain, it's been broken down into uh, three very uh, it, simple but yet very major. So it, it really begins that you, you have to plan your un units using standards, then you have to align your resources, and then there's an element that was always in the model but it wasn't spelled out nearly as uh, clearly, that when you plan, you you have to plan to, to close the achievement gap every day. This is not talking about the end of the year. This is talking those formative pieces that you are going to use to plan to close the achievement gap. You have to plan for that. Otherwise, it may or may not happen. So planning has become very refined and uh, really drives the uh, instructional, what happens in the classroom. So you kind of see those two arrows. And I'm going to move first to standards-based instruction. So if you're familiar with our current work, you know that standards-based instruction would include uh, design questions two, three, and four. For those of you that are new, that was about 18, 19 different elements. Those have been reduced to the 10 most critical elements uh, out of 
teaching, what the teacher uses from her repertoire uh, uh, that are effective and have an impact on student achievement. And they still follow a progression from uh, simple, from what I'm going to say simple, or from teacher uh, oriented to more releasing responsibilities. So it is a gradual release from teacher-centered to student-centered. And it's also a gradual release from sometimes less complex to more complex. But if we're evaluating you on 10 critical elements, we believe that over time, teachers should be able to grow and demonstrate competency in all of these instructional elements. And then if you look, it's hard to separate it, the conditions for learning. And again, if you look at the very first element there, it says uses formative assessment to track progress. Well, that was always in our model, and it was actually in every element, and it was actually uh, the second element, the model. We actually move that to become a condition for learning because in order for kids to learn, they need to know where they are and where they're going. So formative assessment to track progress we're excited to kind of call it out. It was always there, but it was not always totally understood. Then if you look down through there, you're going to see those conditions that we typically, and we always want to see, that we organize kids, put them in groups. We have rules and procedures in our classrooms. We use engagement strategies. If you're familiar with one of the, the original models, uh, that used to be design question five, which had about eight different engagement strategies. And now we've put all those together into one element. So the relation piece is still there. And then look at that last condition. It's the high expectations for every student to each student to close the achievement gap. And the teacher has to make that a condition in their classroom. Uh, and, it, and you can see many of these tie right back up to standards-based planning. And the last piece of this is the professional responsibilities. And you kind of see how it's down there on the bottom because, again, if you don't adhere to your rules and procedures, those other things probably aren't going to happen. We also believe that uh, you have to maintain that expertise in content and pedagogy just because you, you know, were wonderful five years ago doesn't mean you don't need to keep up with the standards and keep growing. So maintaining expertise and growing is critical. So this is what I like to call our success map. If you want to be successful, if you want to grow your practice and you want your kids to show that they are achieving, if you uh, really implement those instructional strategies, you're going to grow as a teacher. So let's look and review real for a real quick second here the design of this model on the next slide, please, Lee. So if you just looked at that map, what you're going to see is that it sets us up for rigorous based systems in every classroom. It looks at student results, it's very objective, and it actually has an instructional model within the simplistic, this focus model. There is, the, if you look at the, those uh, instructional elements and the conditions, there is an embedded scaffold in instructional model. So getting focused, we really had to, again, look at the research, look at current data so that we could build a model that would meet all of these kinds of designs. Let's look at the next slide and let's talk about this question. So what should be the goal if we as a school or a district want to use and implement this model? Why would we want to do that? And the bullets answer that question because this model is going to increase the specificity and accuracy of observations. We have already seen inter-rater agreement improvement uh, by about eight to nine points from the legacy model. And this was the first year. It will only keep getting better. So the, the model also is designed so that it reduces the time spent on evaluation so that you can do more uh, observation. You can do give more feedback. But the actual evaluation, because, and we're not going into it in this webinar, is that we 
he believed this should be a competency-based model. And when you meet the competency, then you move on to the next uh, element. So it's built to give very strong feedback, and it also allows for uh, using elements that align with uh, Achieve the Core. So, and again, there are other webinars that will get into that. So, but these are some of the, the reasons and some of the benefits that a district or a school uh, can cite for moving to this model. So Lee, let's talk about the next slide, which is the protocol. I like to call this the menu for success. So go ahead and put it all up there. And this menu for success, for every element in the model, there, there's a matching protocol. So right now there are 21 elements. And so there are 21 protocols. These make the system so transparent. These are what I like to say, they are the best friend of a teacher, they're the best friend of an observer because they walk you through step by step. The focus statement tells you what behaviors you need to see, the desired effect is the outcome, it gives you techniques that a teacher would use, it tells you some sample ways to monitor the formative assessment, monitoring for learning is formative assessment, it gives you some example student evidence, and then if you need to make an adaptation, it it actually gives you large categories. These are big categories of behaviors. They're not specific categories. And they are, uh, I'm gonna say this probably uh, more than once, but these should be available and used by everyone within the system. So that if a teacher says, I really don't know what critical content is, or I don't really know what, how to do similarities and differences, you can get your protocol out and it will actually give you multiple examples. And if, when you go into eye observation, if you wanna know about those techniques for monitoring, you click on one of those categories, it'll actually open up a whole category. And I think Lee will probably show you that in a little bit. So Lee, because my time is getting short, will you go very quickly to the uh, scale? And I want you to see us, our scale. We have a four point scale. If, well, it's really five, zero to four. It can be converted to match the language of any state. And it works well with either, if your state has a five point scale or a four point scale, it works. Eye observation makes all of that configuration and all those changes for you. And the best part is the scale is the same for every element. And really the scale is the same, the zero through four for all of our models, whether it's school leader, teacher, non-classroom or district, we have a common scale. Let's look at this next slide because this is another piece of the transparency that I like to point out on the next slide, Lee. Uh, there is a five step process, which obviously in a, webinar, we don't have time to walk through all five of those. So Lee is gonna just pop them up one at a time. But what happens in this process, this is for an observer. So the observer would use this to uh, walk through what they are seeing. If you're a teacher, then you can use this. So what will my observer be looking for? So it's a very transparent five-step observation process. And again, uh, I have many districts that print this and post this so everybody knows what the process is. Between this and the protocol, it is very clear. The last little part of this would be the actual process of not just the actual classroom observation, but Lee, let's look at the next slide. So if we want to get a really good accurate score for a teacher. How does it all begin? Well, it begins in a pre-planning conference where we look at the lesson plan, where we talk about what our learning tar targets are going to be, what standard that we're teaching. Then we actually have the observation and it ends in a reflection conference. And we would say during that reflection conference is when you look at your student evidence and you actually come to your final uh, observation scores and give your actual feedback. So uh, the last slide that we're really gonna look at is how do you collect this observation uh, data? Again, this is a much longer conversation, but it can be through formal observation, informal, targeted or focused and walkthroughs. 
these will all be dis district decisions, but it is designed to be used with all of these different ways to collect teacher data. So finally, the last couple of slides, then I put them at the end because we typically get short on time, but for those of you that want to know about the validation, it's still all there. You want to know the research base and all the supports that are available. The next slide talks about all the books that are out there that show the research base. It all begins with the art and science of teaching. Well, that's kind of the culminating. The books on the left were precursors to that work, but the art and science of teaching effective supervision and even the new uh, art and science of teaching. This model is very highly aligned with the new art and science of teaching. So if you're uh, reading that book, you know that book and you look at this model, you're going to say, oh, I see the same language. So I went a few minutes over my time, but uh, Lee, do we want to see if we have any questions or do you want to save those for later? Yeah, I've got, we've had several questions uh, come in. One okay. that was, uh, that you could probably help with Beverly is, they're asking about standards and how does the model um, help in a, in a, to create that standards-based classroom as teachers plan their instruction and what the lessons look like? Well, you uh, actually, the question actually alludes to it. It all begins with taking those standards. If your district has already unpacked them for you and you don't have to unpack them, then it's about focusing on those benchmark or anchor standards and making sure that uh, your learning targets actually come directly from the standards. But you know what I told teachers and uh, observers? Folks, it's not just about writing that learning target to focus on the standards it is to create activities that are aligned to the same taxonomy level of the standard so a much longer conversation is taxonomy's role in standards and this model is built to support all of it so our training will will actually take you there so that if uh, you, you really want to see how the the standards work it, it's Again, it's more than a one second kind of answer, but it all relates with taxonomy, activities, and use of instructional strategies. They all work together in this model. Good, thanks. Uh, we have time maybe for, for one more. The, the question, does this just include observation, um, meaning perhaps a, a one-way uh, street, or can the teacher submit artifacts? Um, th for the process. Well, again, we would advocate for that ultimately becomes a district decision, but we believe that the best way to get a true evaluation or a true picture of teacher would require a lot more time than most of us as observers have to give. So if I go in to observe a teacher for 45 minutes and I have to leave a lesson and I don't know how the students actually performed on the task that at hand, then we believe that the teachers should be able to bring those artifacts that the students were working on to that post-conference, and then we would do the final scoring. So yes, and when you get to professional responsibilities, uh, you definitely are going to have student, I mean, teachers presenting artifacts. So yes, this is really, it's not a gotcha system. It's a lot more of a constructivist view. It's a lot more of an interactive view, but still very scientific in that our scale is still very systematic and very transparent scale. It's You're either at one level or the other based on the evidence. Good. Thanks, Beverly. And appreciate the, uh, appreciate the feedback on those. And this is an excellent segue because one of the questions was dealing with professional development. And the, these are what you see here on the screen are some opportunities uh, in both Florida and Oklahoma. So making the transition, what that means is that's a day of, of training to help prepare observers. How is this different than the, uh, than the 2014 model that you might have been using? And we take, um, we spend a lot of time on inter reliability. 
uh, scoring to help observers make that transition. So they're very familiar uh, with, with the intent of the model and how things, uh, what's the same and what's different. The, the others you see there on the right, training for observers. This is in the realm of training for new observers, those that have, have never had any training uh, on this model or the, the, the 2014 model. So all of these um, deal with that. These are three-day sessions and watch your email for more information. If you have questions on, on any of these, um, uh, Mary Lynn and myself would be happy to, to help answer any questions uh, once you get that um, email in the, the registration link. Lee, so, I'd also, yes. I'd also like to add in here that while those trainings are specifically geared for your administrator observers, LSI does also offer half day and full day PD sessions in your district for your teachers to help them make that transition and understand the shifts and the changes between that 2014 and the new focus model. Yes, that's an excellent point Marilyn and uh, to add to that um, another really good one is the side-by-side uh, -side coaching where a staff developer walks with observers helps them because it, it's um, they're learning about it of course in the the training and then we actually walk with them in their classrooms help them with uh, construct feedback and um, go deeper in terms of rater agreement rater accuracy so it's an that's another good session uh, in addition to the to the teacher training that you mentioned and another really uh exciting opportunity uh we'd be remiss not to mention the chance to to meet dr carball and dr robert marzano at the building expertise national conference this summer june 13th through the 15th in orlando uh, it always includes valuable sessions on both evaluation uh, as well as growth and other uh, other sessions for, for professional learning, uh, networking, uh, we, and we have some, some fun activities. So this is a fantastic uh, opportunity to, uh, um, to do some learning this summer. We even have a special discount code, uh, LSI Web, LSI W-E-B, when you register, you can use that uh, use that code for a uh, for a special discount. And with that, I'm going to transition, uh, take you into eye observation briefly, so you can see what it actually looks like in um, as you take that model into your into your school for for implementation, and what observers what observers see. So. This is the eye observation. Um, this is a web-based system. And the nice thing is it's, it is uh, in implementation. Everyone has an account, all teachers, all observers, all administrators. And one of the big things that Beverly uh, mentioned was the data. So she showed some national data in terms of frequency. And that's one of the biggest benefits uh, that uh, in my work with districts and probably Mary Lynn's as well, going back and looking at that data so that you saw the national data and, and but schools and districts are interested, well, what does my data look like? What are we observing uh, when observers go into the classroom? What are they not observing? Is it is it different uh, among different sites in the building? So that is a, uh, that's one of the, the nice benefits is it gives a, a district or school a unique window into into what's going on with their uh, uh, with their school or district. So one of the things, if I'm an if I'm an observer, I can go into the uh, the system, and this is a fairly new addition in terms of observer progress. So you can see here the focus teacher evaluation model, and this has my teachers uh, required look fors. How many have I have I done? what's in draft, how many have I finished, and then the number remaining. And I even have this, this uh, more explicitly here in terms of the, the F for, for um, formal, I for informal, and W for, for walkthrough. So those are checked automatically as I, as I make progress. And then you can see the other uh, models that we support as well. And, and 
by the way, the system also supports that. We, this webinar is just dealing with the, the teacher, the focus teacher model, but there are three other models that, um, that are being updated and some exciting revisions to those that the, uh, that the system also supports. So let's go into, this is my list of teachers and we're going to kind of give you a brief window into what it looks like to conduct a, an observation. So you see here the, the type. I can declare, is this a formal, informal? And I just check one of those. Uh, we also added evidences that uh, you see are universal evidences. But you can also, if you're going into an ELA or, uh, or literacy classroom, you can check those. And some specific subject area evidences will um, will be on that protocol page as well as math. I can save this, I can come back to it. And um, one of the, the questions was on artifacts. So before I finish this, because once I finish it, it goes right to the teacher's email box. They get a link, they open it up to see the, the feedback. But I can save a draft. I can collaborate with a teacher on specific strategies and um, either have a virtual conversation or a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So Beverly did mention these as competencies. And that's a that's somewhat of a shift maybe from what you're used to. Um, maybe you're using a different model uh, or maybe you're using the, the 2014 Marzano model. But one of the exciting things for observers, you see this box here, results count towards annual evaluation. Once I check that, you see these icons pop up. And this is to help me in, in again, the, the, with the mission of uh, competencies that we're helping teachers with. And I've got, if, if I'm a principal with, uh, with 40 teachers, they all have their differences and they, they all have uh, some strengths, some, some areas where they're strong in, some areas where they're challenged in. And this shows me where have I, where has this, in this case, Faith Fletcher, what has she been observed on and how is she doing so far? So green, this green star, her evaluation at this point is at applying or above. The gold star, the evaluation is at developing or below. The question mark, it hasn't been scored yet. So as an observer, when maybe I'm going to do an observation in her classroom this afternoon, I want to pull this up to see where she stands, what's been observed, because if if they have, uh, if Faith has done a good job, maybe of planning standards-based lessons and units, uh, I don't necessarily need to see that again, or previewing new content. She's shown high level of competency in that in that area. What I'm what I'm interested in is how. I can support her in, in improving and in, in helping students process new content or helping students examine their reasoning or some of the, the strategies that have not been scored yet. Another point you see this bullseye here next to similarities and differences. This tells me as an observer, this is what Faith is chosen for her growth plan this year. And this is another helpful tool within the system that helped automate that process of what did, uh, what did Faith as a teacher, she's chosen something that maybe she doesn't, hasn't done a lot of or would like to improve on uh, because she believes it will help her, help her students. And this is a, uh, an autom automated way that she can go in as a self-assessment and can choose an area that she wants to focus on. That goes to approval to, to the observer. And then that is in, uh, in effect for typically the school year. So that is, uh, that's what that bullseye is. So let's go into one of the strategies here, identifying critical content from the standards. And you can see the focus statement that, uh, that Beverly mentioned in the slides, the desired effect which is very helpful for, for reflection for the teachers and, and observers for their, in their feedback. Did it have the desired effect uh, that you wanted it to? And this one is, is very straightforward. Uh, students know what content is important and what's not important as it relates to the learning target. 
then you see the evidences. So Beverly showed that on the, uh, we've talked about in the slides. And I can expand these. And again, this is a great help for teachers as they're planning. Well, what techniques am I going to use for this? Uh, observers go into the classroom and maybe they're seeing some of these. Maybe they see some uh, storytelling or dramatic instruction, verbal, visual cueing. And I can check these to inform my feedback. Uh, to help the teacher as I'm as I'm seeing these. And this is one of the new sections that uh, that schools really like. Observers uh, like this, uh, teachers like this as well for their planning. But how I'm using the technique, but how do I know it's working? How do I what monitoring techniques should I be should I be be using? So this is expanded from from what you saw on the slides again, to help teachers as they're, as they're planning. So if for a group activity, I could use think, pair, share, uh, I could summarize critical content. Student work, I could, I could solicit some short written responses. Uh, students could be using a graphic organizer, response methods, questioning sequences. So lots of help, lots of examples for, for teachers that they can see there and observers what strategies or, or what techniques might I be seeing in terms of monitoring for this strategy. Student evidence of the desired effect. I can put in a, a percentage of students uh, as, a, as a means of feedback and again for for growth you saw remember that that um, that balance there uh, between measurement and growth. Uh, this is a, a perfect example if maybe I'm Maybe it's 50% of students that it had the desired effect with. Well, maybe next time let's that's uh, let's get to maybe 75%. So then you can see other examples for the um, the student evidence piece in uh, in what I might be seeing. And then lastly, what if uh, what if it wasn't as successful as I as I thought it would be as a teacher? Here are some adaptations, and this is a new section that. Um, you may not have seen. Uh, it was always in the uh, in previous models, but this is more explicit help for teachers and some examples. What could I do uh, to help uh, adapt this to a, a particular classroom or situation? Uh, I've got some reflection questions uh, that can help me as I am offering some feedback and putting in my comments. So if I scored this at the developing level, I can look right here and see. So how might you use a progression of standards-based learning targets, uh, et cetera, to, to help get to the applying level? So I could copy and paste that. I could put that into the comments. Here's where I do my, my scoring. And a nice addition here is I just hover over these to see what each, to, to get a reminder, what does the developing level mean? I can put in comments and I can choose an electronic file. If I wanted, say, if I had a, uh, a picture of some, some evidence or I had uh, something that I wanted to include, maybe a document, any electronic file, I can upload that right there as and make it part of the, part of the observation. So that is a brief, walk through a single element and I'll go back to the table of com contents and the, uh, the the success map. So what you see here now, now this is a, uh, a bold star with a black outline to let me know I have been in this strategy in this particular observation. So that's what it looks like in terms of an observer conducting a, uh, an observation in the, in the classroom. Lee, we're getting some great questions of, and okay. some great feedback about the new eye observation. And one of the questions that's being asked is, when we shift over to this new interface, will their teachers still be able to access their prior year growth plans? Traditionally, each growth plan um, is a year meaning it, 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 uh, it, starts, it starts over. Uh, the, there's a configuration for growth plans that you submit to, your, to the account team, and those are in place for a year, and we track that information. But I believe we can access that, we can help you access that if you wanted to see uh, what's been done in prior years. 
So another, uh, another helpful tool, we mentioned in the slides, the, uh, the resource library. So this helps, so I can, I can do a search on, uh, on a particular strategy and we have incidentally, we've added hundreds of new resources in here aligned to the focus model. Um, you can see one here on previewing new content. Um, I picked this one, we saw this in the slides. So I can open this up and view a, uh, you see this video, six minutes and 15 seconds. I can share this, which is helpful because I can make a, uh, a new discussion and I can add teachers to this and I can post this, make a title and post a message and then they all receive it and we can have a, we can have a dialogue virtually uh, or have them prepare maybe if we are going to talk about it in a, in a meeting. But what I wanted to also show you, we've also included, you see here a debrief uh, document here. So talking about previewing, so that you can watch the video and then you can see, uh, you can see the, the, the standard that the teacher was teaching, the scale that they were using. You see what they scored for that particular strategy. You see the rationale for that, for that score. And then feedback and guiding questions for the teacher. So very helpful in terms of resources that are, that are available uh, within eye observation. We also have uh, books, white papers that, uh, that Beverly mentioned. Um, so lots of helpful tools. So as an observer or an administrator, you're not, you're not shouldered with all of that, uh, all of that burden, all of the questions. There are plenty of resources to help in that, uh, um, in that regard. So I know we're, we're winding down on time. I wanna leave um, plenty of time for, for questions. So if you see, uh, if you have some questions, if you put it in that chat box, uh, or Mary Lynn, if you see some more questions, just, uh, just let me know. While, uh, while we're taking those questions, I'm going to call up the growth plans page just to give you a, uh, a feel for what that, what that looks like. And this, as I mentioned, so Faith Fletcher determined she wants to improve on similarities and differences. And she put her starting point at beginning. Her final goal is at applying. And then the system automatically captures the observations that are done in, those partic in, the, in this particular strategy, in this case, similarities and differences. She has a reflection log, so she can, she can make some entries as she's learning about the strategy how do i need to prepare my lessons differently and then there's action steps so how specifically am i going to improve in this particular strategy so very helpful very intentional process as uh, as teachers are improving in, in specific strategies so i'm going to i'm going to uh, try and access the questions here I see one um, in terms of my last observation, uh, we didn't have this. In terms of using eye observation, we didn't have this platform. Uh, is this already updated? Yes, this, is, uh, this was recently updated. If you don't see all of the, uh, all of the functions, I'm not sure which, um, which model that you're using, but we can certainly, can, we can certainly help you with that and we can uh, we can follow up after after the call and and for districts that are just getting ready to make the shift to the focus model in the upcoming year you would see most of these new features put into place next year when your uh, eye observation account is configured at the start of the school year we don't tend to make these kind of shifts mid-year so hopefully what Lee has just shared with you has sort of gotten you a bit excited and perhaps whetted your appetite for what is going to be available next year. And the Diamond and Platinum support teams can work with the eye observation contact from your school or your district 
during account configuration to ensure that you get access to all of these great new features. Yeah, thanks, Marilyn. And also looking at a question here, uh, can you use this format with alongside your your district's model? And that's a that's a good question because I, I mentioned earlier there are we've covered the teacher model in the webinar today and we can certainly uh, if you want to have a conversation about the other three models um, at uh, on, on a future date we certainly can those being the the non-classroom instructional support the school leader evaluation model and the district leader evaluation model we also support um, we work with districts that, uh, for example, I work with some personally, maybe that they have a reading initiative that they want to have, uh, they want to add a questionnaire within the system that, that deals with that uh, priority for their school. Um, that's something that we can, we can support as well um, in, addition to the, uh, in addition to the models that, uh, that we're talking about today. So we are, um, let's see if there's another question that, uh, that we have time to get to. So in terms of the, um, someone's asking about the summative page and let me, uh, let me get there. So for Faith Fletcher, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to her view and so for her, this would be my evaluations. And this would be what she would see on an, on an ongoing basis. So you can see these two boxes. And again, based on your state, based on what goes to inform your score, this would be customized for your, uh, for your district and your, your uh, what the parameters are for your state. So you would see an instructional practice score uh, in many states. Some would have a student growth component. Uh, we can also add a, uh, a score that would be dealing with deliberate practice or that would be aligned to the, to the growth plan that I showed you. Observations that are used in this evaluation. So at any time, the teacher can go in, uh, view in a new window exactly what uh, what transpired in that observation. I can see who the observer was. Um, I can see the frequency requirements that my district um, has in terms of formal, informal walkthrough. But I want to show you the, uh, the nice thing now that is a, that's a shift, again, towards a competency approach. So for standards-based planning, you can see the strategies here, and I can see the last observations. So I can see at a, at, a, at a snapshot where, how I'm doing in these and where I can improve um, and maybe what has not been scored. So as I look at standards-based instruction, you see some that have not been scored yet. So again, just a slightly different approach, but so far the, uh, the feedback has been very positive and I believe this is a, a step in the right direction to really help teachers in uh, specifically on these these strategies in um, the ones that they're maybe more accomplished on uh, and to also see the ones that uh, that they need to uh, that they would like to work more on or, or some areas that uh, and from that you can get an idea for maybe an entire school uh, if some maybe examining reasoning might be a more challenging one how can we help teachers in that uh, in that regard and Lee, one of the powerful things about this uh, particular uh, feature is that it allows teachers to track their own progress in real time. We could not do that, or we don't do it in the other models. So this is uh, very exciting for a teacher. They can actually see their observations build to form their end of year evaluation. Yes, yes, excellent point. And the, um, that's part of the, the mission, very straightforward. Everyone sees, uh, very transparent. Uh, everyone sees what's, what's going on. Uh, teachers, of course, can, can see their, their data, as I'm showing you here. Um, they can also, they can do a, a self-observation and they can do a peer-to-peer -peer observation that's, that's private 
uh, among their their colleagues. So very versatile system that operationalizes the uh, the model. So I believe with that we are we are running up against our time factor here for the webinar. But I uh, there's one more yes. there's one more question in here that I think is probably a common concern for many of our participants is the um, master list of teachers that you showed briefly showing how many people had had required observation and who was still lacking. And what if you could just flash back to that real quickly? Sure. So I went to observations and I'm sorry, I need to go back to my screen as an observer. Under observations, I'm clicking on observation progress. And this shows me what uh, a good snapshot as I'm as I'm planning out my time and planning out my observations, uh, which which teachers have I observed, how many times, and re require remaining required observations. So these are just hypothetical numbers. So this is by no means um, any requirement or or anything like that that we put in the system. This is going to be designed for your your school or your district. Does that answer the? Yep, I think that's question? probably what they were looking for. Okay, yeah, we'd be happy to to help you more if you if you're if you happen not to be seeing this, we can uh, we can connect you with your account team uh, to get this in place. And and in, in regardless of where you are within the country, um, you have someone like Lee or myself who works with schools and districts in your state, and any one of us would be happy to set up another webinar. For or your administrative team or your uh, leadership group to show these new features and help you decide if this is the direction that you'd like to go. Yes, absolutely. We'd, we'd be happy to help you and we appreciate your, your time on the, the webinar this morning and look forward to, to speaking with you soon. Thank you. Have All a right, day, everyone. Everybody. Thanks, everyone.